is our overall title, The Quest, Pursuing Spiritual Excellence. And that's what we see here in Daniel. And that's why I wanted to change tack very slightly for this morning. You see, it starts with a remarkable dream. Second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams in plural. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Literally, his sleep left him and it appears that his sleep left him over a period of time. So what we have here is not merely a single dream, which could be caused by anything from an overstimulating day to the wrong kind of cheese for supper. Um, this is a repeated dream, which deprives him of sleep. This is a recurring nightmare. And from the outset, Nebuchadnezzar is convinced that it contains something of major importance, something of world-scale significance. And it raises this whole intriguing question of whether God communicates through dreams, and we believe that he does. Because if he does, then I'd like to know how to discern whether God is speaking to me, or whether the stuff that goes through my head in the night is just complete fluff, or my brain trying to make some sense of the crazy day that I've just had. And furthermore, if this is truly God speaking, then why is he selecting an, a, you know, a pagan, God-ignoring Nebuchadnezzar to receive his message and not one of his own people, like Daniel, or Hananiah, or Mishael, or Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedjigo? Surely, you know, the Lord could have found a more receptive ear to whisper into. But he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, what God is going to demonstrate through the events that we're going to think about in the next 20 minutes is he is sovereign over the affairs of men. Now, let me make, just by way of introduction, a few observations about how we perceive this sort of activity. You can make some notes that's there in your, uh, in your new sheet if you'd like to take it out and find, find a pen. Most of us here in this room were educated in the prosperous West in the late 21st and early, uh, the late 20th and early 21st century. Therefore, we look through life at a very, very, in a very, very different way from that which Nebuchadnezzar looked at life two and a half thousand years ago and more. The dominant worldview that we have imbibed is the scientific, rational worldview. We live our lives, by and large, by, through scientific rationalism. That's the lens. We hold science in high regard, and we seek to apply strict logic to it. So that if I can touch it, if I can feel it, if I can analyse it, then I know it. And that's where the so-called new atheists have jumped in, like Richard Dawkins and his pals, they would tell us, they take this one step further, they would tell us that scientific rationalism is the only valid way to interpret the universe. There is no other. Of course, as Christian believers today, we here would say there is another way of looking at the universe. There's a spiritual side to it. And when I say spiritual, I mean spiritual in the very widest sense. Spiritual including both our relationship with God and the reality of the occult. And the Bible contains some quite specific warnings about the occult. And we live in a society today where there tends to be a gap between these two. In Nebuchadnezzar's day, there was not a great deal of scientific rationalism, although there were people who sought to understand the world. We know it from Babylonian literature, from ancient extra-biblical texts. We also know there was a, a great interest in spiritual things in that time. But there wasn't the gap that we had today. There wasn't this sense, well, you know, if you're, you're a Christian, that's fine, as long as you keep it private. It was woven together. And that brings us to, to Nebuchadnezzar. You see, with this, Nebuchadnezzar sought an occult solution to a spiritual quest. And he, in, he sought... He asked the, the astrologers and the magicians and all that kind of, those kinds of people to come in and interpret his dream. And the Bible warns us against some of these 
occult practices. Actually, it warns us against all of them. But in particular, it tends to highlight four things that we need to be careful of and beware of, which are practiced in our society today. For example, married, uh, magic practices. The attempt to control the environment by spells and incantations. You don't have to go very far on the internet to find them. Or divination. Divination is the attempt to predict the future without recourse to God's will. Without listening to the Holy Spirit. And things like, like palmistry and reading tea leaves and tarot card readings all come into this, this kind of category. Can I do something odd like sprinkle some stuff on the ground and then get somebody to tell me what my future is going to be? That's divination. Then there's spiritism. We're warned against that in the Bible. Spiritism is the attempt to contact the dead after they've crossed the boundary between this life and the next. And one of the things that I have to do occasionally as a pastor is to help people out of spiritism. Well, they've been affected by the, the uh, results of a seance or something of, of that order. And the fourth one is astrology. Astrology relies on the assumption that the movements of the planets materially affect what we do. So in that sense, astrology attacks two major aspects of who God is. First of all, it undermines his sovereignty because it claims that something other than God can make things happen in this world and in my life. And secondly, if my life is controlled or at least influenced by stars then I'm cutting out what God can do in my life. I'm excluding him. And therefore it undermines my free will because if the, the placement of the planets in the solar system or the stars or in the sky affects me personally, then I'm no longer making free choices. Actually, you, many of you will know I used to be a mathematician and mathematicians can quite effectively predict where the stars are going to be in, in not just next year but 100 years' time. Now, when, interestingly, when Saul... Uh, the king of Israel drifted into consulting uh, occult mediums, God had to deal with him very severely, and in fact he lost his kingdom as a consequence. Now these are precisely the people that Nebuchadnezzar is drawing on to find his wisdom. Look at verse 2. The king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they could, came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. So Nebuchadnezzar had had a spiritual experience, but he sought an occult explanation for that spiritual experience. There you go. So I think it would be a good idea now for us just to look at the character of Nebuchadnezzar and try and understand why this man behaved the way he did. Because we are not talking about someone who engaged in scientific rationalism. There's a spectrum moving from scientific rationalism at one end to spiritual reality of the other, but they are not equal and opposite. Interestingly, you see, because where, where, the, where the atheists deny the existence of God, the Christian need never deny the existence of science or never even question the, uh, the evidence placed in front of us. In fact, in scientific history, it is remarkable how many groundbreaking scientists were Christian believers and who saw their Christian faith as the driver of their scientific research. We're thinking God's thoughts after him. But that wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. And if we look at Nebuchadnezzar, there's one word that comes out to me about this man. This man is a bully. The king replied to the astrologers, verse 5, this is what I have firmly decided, no consultation, I've just made it up for myself. If you do not tell me what my dream is and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Actually, that's a euphemism. The original text says it will be turned into a dung heap, a pile of poo. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts and rewards and great honour. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. No pressure. But my friends, this passage is amazingly contemporary. Because these are not the actions of a leader commanding the respect of his people. This man is a bully. This is a weak man who, because of difficulties in his own psyche, is taking out his frustrations on the people around him. And bullying is an increasing phenomenon 
an occurrence in our homes and our, in our workplaces. Bullying happens over social networks. Bullying happens in the workplace. It can happen in a home. And it is increasingly being regarded as a health hazard. And if we look in Daniel chapter 2, we can see so much bullying going on. Take, for example, verse 5. He's making unrealistic demands. That's the anatomy of bullying. The king replied to the astrologers, verse 5, this is what I have firmly decided if you do not tell me what my dream is. And so on. This is quite impossible, and they knew that. The bully makes unrealistic demands. Then also, I notice the bully engages in aggressive behaviour. You can see that again in verse 5. I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of poo. He makes threats and acts aggressively to the, to the people around him. Then he ignores reasonable requests. Look at verse 7. Once more they said to him, Please, let the king tell us what the dream is and we'll interpret it. Give us something to go on and we'll tell you something. But he was not going to do that. Even reasonable requests for changes in their circumstances are ignored by the bully. And he will take, he or she, because it might be a she, uh, take it one step further, perhaps even imputing hidden motives. Verse 8, the king answered, I'm certain that you are trying to gain time because you realise that this is what I've, I've decided. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will go away. He imputed a hidden motive to them. Oh, you're just trying to wind me up. You're just trying to play for time. Well, actually, if my life was threatened, I think I'd try to play for time if I hadn't got anything else to play for. This is a classic conspiracy theory, seeing an interpretation of the events that simply isn't there. And then the bully makes unrealistic demands. Verse 10. There is not a man on the earth who can do what the king demands, his advisers said to him. This demand is completely unrealistic. Please, can we have some sense here? But because the king, because the bully is so intransigent, he creates an atmosphere of despair. And you can see that, in, actually I'll put verse 10, it's verse 11. What the king asks is too difficult. Creating despair keeps the bully in his position of power. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. And all of these characteristics of bullying we can see today. And what happens when the bully doesn't seem to be getting his way? Well, look at verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of the wise men of Babylon. In order to maintain his position, he will engage in systematic first-degree murder. He is beside himself. And take note of what he did in this fit of rage. He wants to eliminate all the wise men around him. He wants to act completely independently. And not take notice of people around uh, in, in his entourage. And whenever a leader bypasses the wisdom of his advisors, he risks becoming a despot. And then just as the situation seems hopeless, God steps in. Look at verse 24. This is the pivot point of the chapter. This is the moment when things begin to change. Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute these men. Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for him. One solitary person steps into the crisis. And when we step into crises like this, the question is not how do we handle a crisis, because there is no magic answer. The question is how do I handle myself? So in huge contrast to Nebuchadnezzar and his bullying, we're now going to look at Daniel. And we're going to see how he stepped in appropriately. Verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone to put to death the wise men, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. It wasn't just that Daniel spoke to him, it was the way that he spoke. Arioch could see that this man meant business. He actually went to him face to face. He didn't send him an email or a tweet. He actually visited him. 
And then the whole communicated package of this man's grace and his wisdom could be felt by Ariel. I think that's why Daniel included that phrase in his book, because it matters. The wisdom and tact that we need to use when dealing with bullies. But also, he wasn't a walkover because he was alert to the deeper questions that were going on here. Look at verse 15. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? What is it in Nebuchadnezzar, that, what is it in the bully that makes him act like this? And Arioch explained the matter. Now we're not told what it was that Arioch said to Daniel, but we can make a fairly safe guess. We're pretty sure that he told Daniel that for months he'd had the, that Nebuchadnezzar had had this recurring nightmare. And he was taking out his frustration and his anxiety on the people around him, particularly on the wise men who were in his entourage. You see, Nebuchadnezzar thought the problem was all out there. It's nothing to do with me. It's all out there. But Daniel could see that the problem was within him rather than in the external world. As soon as we think the problem is all out there, then that thought becomes the problem. See, Daniel avoided a hurry. Can you see that in verse 16? Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream. My friends, God is never in a hurry. He looks at the big picture and invites us to join him day by day by faithfully walking with him to bring that big picture into being. And did you notice that in Daniel saying to the king, please can I have time, he's actually asking for exactly the same thing as the astrologers did earlier on. And the king threw a wobbly and said, no, I'm going to kill you off. But something about Daniel's spiritual excellence, something about this man's wisdom and tact convinced Nebuchadnezzar, okay, I'll give him this one. Give me time, he said. God is not in a hurry. Now, if that was the case, what would you do? Well, we can see what Daniel did. He went to his friends and said, guys, I need you to pray for me. Daniel is acting so very differently from the bully here. The bully says, I'm going to handle this by myself. I'm going to use my own strength and power. I'm going to use my clout. Daniel says, come on guys, I can't do this by myself. I need you around me. Verse 17, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Had Daniel taken this on himself, I'm convinced he would have crumpled under the strain. But with the support of his three friends, he didn't. And in a situation like this, I notice how he behaved very bravely in the face of a bully. You see, Daniel is actually encouraging Arioch to defy the king's orders. This will be regarded as nothing short of treason. And then he spoke the truth to the king. And what happened? Well, that's the rest of the chapter. You can read that later on if you want. Did Daniel discern what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was? Did God reveal it to him? Yes, he did. Did God show Daniel what the dream meant? Yes, he did. And in so doing, he, God demonstrated that he is sovereign in the affairs of men. And I think this was a wake-up call for Nebuchadnezzar. That the traditional ways of doing things, in his case, seeking occult solutions, were never going to be the way in which God was going to work. Actually, later on, we're going to see a spiritual change in Nebuchadnezzar. That doesn't come in this passage. That comes a bit later on. So if there's a message that comes out of this whole thing, it is that even in the face of a bully... God is sovereign. Even in the face of a threat to murder, God is sovereign. And as we look over this world, we have to say to ourselves, as, 
I've already been reminded today, we're in, a, we're in a situation of political turmoil at the moment. My friends, God is sovereign. And he asks us to do nothing more than to live for him. And then he will take care of the rest. In a moment, we're going to sing. We're going to take up our morning offering. But before we do that, let's bow our heads. I'm going to read that prayer that Daniel prayed. Facing such a dire situation, he, he went to the Lord with praise and with gratitude. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Because wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. Lord, I thank you, O God of my fathers, that you have given us wisdom and power. You have made known to me what I asked of you. And I will now tell the king the dream. 